I'm Eric. And I'm Jamie. And this is Horoscope, a podcast for people who love horror movies. And people who want to love them. But you know who will like this movie? Our very, not first. Our very third third guest. guest. (laughs) Katie Lee! Ta-da! Katie Lee actually was supposed to be our first guest in the beginning days of the podcast in the Lost to the Archives Wicker Man episode. R.I.P. Yeah, the audio is not good. It went up in flames, just like the Wicker Man. (laughs) It happened like it was supposed to happen. So... We have brought Katie Lee back. I'm back. Better than ever. Prepared. Fully loaded. Ready to go. Brought note cards. Also, Katie Lee is my sister. Oh, hey. Yeah, that's not an echo you're hearing from Jamie. (laughs) It's just too... We're watching Crimson Peak. Ah! Ah! (laughs) We're watching Crimson Peak, and we've brought Katie Lee in as our resident goth. (laughs) Yeah. How I'm about that? So, I, it is an honor. And I am so, so, so excited to watch this movie because I just binged all of Penny Dreadful and whack. It had its own problems, but I needed something gothy and Victorian and ridiculous. And this film is going to deliver. I think it's it is. Three. It's gothy, ridiculous. Yeah. And the third thing you said. Okay. What did I do? <laughs> well, okay, first of all, before we okay, get into okay, the okay. movie, because I, I think what's going to happen is you two are just going to talk and I'll just go interesting for <laughs> a while um what's your what's your background with horror um so like jamie yourself who <laughs> what raised very conservatively Boo. demons are very scary still correct <laughs> um and then uh i was introduced to gothic horror in high school in english class and i like was really down with that and i really we love an english class illusion on this podcast yeah we stand i wanted to be an english school english school the english teacher <laughs> i wanted school. to be an english school once. No. you'd be a killer english teacher <laughs> it would true. be so fun i don't it'd know it'd be so dramatic so dramatic That's you'd be like dorky you're 14 you're roiling with hormones you need to act yeah. Right now. Yes. The light switch in that classroom would be utilized all the time. <laughs> you know it. I would I would have like atmospheric music, lighting. So you were introduced you were introduced to gothic literature and yes. that that was your nerd gateway into horror. The nerd gateway, I've also always been really interested in like medieval shit, obviously. And then I had my gateway into metal. Do I tell them? Do you tell them? Kid Lee was a historical reenactor. <laughs> <laughs> a medieval historical reenactor. Uh, that's yes. very clear. Uh, specifically 12th century uh, persona. But that's neither here nor there. Oh, it's here. <laughs> <laughs> we're not watching Crimson Peak today. We were talking about this. Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> uh, no. So that was my introduction. Um, and then exploring horror through like metal and going to shows and stuff. And then um, I think... Penny Dreadful was my first full, like, pandemic. I was like, I need to watch something gory and ridiculous, and I did it. Welcome to, welcome to the whole format. (laughs) So you, that's wild. I never really put together that you have experienced horror through every medium but movies. Yeah, I don't know, but that's the thing is like you're doing all the legwork backwards. Yeah, and I love to read horror movie plots like you on Wikipedia. Yeah, and I love to read awful true crime stories. And really go all in that way. And imagination is worse, probably. But it is, yes. Yeah, yes, it I is. feel like I just can't unsee movies. So you know, I don't want to accidentally haunt my house. You haven't. You really wanted to see Crimson Peak. Yeah, I've or, been yeah. like resisting it. So people, the same people that uh, told me to watch Penny Dreadful, were also like, "Oh my God, you're gonna love Crimson Peak." And I was always like, "Oh no, it's too scary." And then I was like, "Oh, I'm gonna save it for a special occasion." And here what could I be am. more special than the night before Halloween? That is true. I was about to say friendship, but that that works. And friendship. Yeah. <laughs> Eric. Do you want to just tell us about the movie? Because I prepared a bunch of stuff about, so basically tapping into my um, English teacher would be <laughs> passed on another plane. Um, I'm going to talk all about romanticism and how we get to gothic horror with a historical context. Wow. Yes. Okay. Yeah. APA excited. <laughs> yeah. So if we want to go over like movie facts, because I guess then that would lead from 
movie facts to where Guillermo got inspiration from, which yeah. will then lead into what you're talking about. This is our first uh, Guillermo del Toro endeavor. Fuck yes. 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 What is both your experience with Guillermo? Pacific Rim! <laughs> <laughs> Immediately red on <laughs> He loves Charlie Hunnam almost as much as me. Yeah. It's true. How is Charlie Hunnam's butt? Superb. Good. <laughs> I watched. Whoa! I watched, no, I watched Pacific Rim with my mom, and she forgot what his name was. And you know, there's like the Australian dude who looks like him in Pacific Rim, also. No. Whatever. And my mom named him Man Cakes. It runs in the family. <laughs> Charlie Man Cakes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We also have seen Charlie Hunnam on Sons of Anarchy, which we somehow watched. Yeah, I don't know. Retrospect. How that happened, Why? But... Wild. Ron Perlman. So also a Guillermo favorite. Mm, that wow. dude is, that his face is... So massive. Very large. <laughs> and so perfect for like everything Guillermo. Did he do yeah. Hellboy? He was Hellboy, yeah. Okay, Guillermo no, not him, but did, yeah, did Guillermo do Hellboy? Yeah, okay. so Guillermo, that was like his big break. So Guillermo pretty much started off in... I love how we're talking like we know him, like he's hmm. our friend. I feel like I'm Guillermo. I like Guillermo de Toro. Some of his movies don't hit as hard for me as others, but in general, mm-hmm. I enjoy him. And he's just like, he does, he's such a fanboy... That, like, made it. I love that. But, like, in a nice way. I think there's a really easy... Joss Whedon. And, yeah. uh, you know, end of discussion. We already you know who we're talking about. Guillermo just loves monsters and just loves the media. Like, God, just fuck like, him. Give him a little loves bullet. butts. He loves butts. And we love him. <laughs> <laughs> we love Guillermo. The name of this episode butt. is We Love <laughs> Butts. <laughs> Stupid. <laughs> not, I feel like it's not going to be off base as we continue to talk. <laughs> Um, so yeah, he's, he grew up in Guadalajara, Mexico, uh, and he was worked in, uh, for 10 years in special effects before he started directing. We love a practical effect, man. He did his first endeavor into like America cinemas was his movie Mimic, which was a Miramax film, which is Weinstein, um, which got me to a interesting trivia fact where apparently Guillermo was treated so poorly by the Weinsteins that at the Oscars, James Cameron, who was also an asshole, but this is like the only good note that I have about him. Is that he almost beat up Weinstein at the Oscars <gasps> for treating Guillermo so poorly? Like, oh, wow! He was like, I almost knocked Weinstein out with my Oscar because Weinstein was bragging about how. We know. I wish he would have done it. That would have saved a lot of time. Yeah, and like, why was it that he mistreated Guillermo poorly that made you want to do that? Why not everything else? Maybe he didn't know everything else, but everyone kind of knew. Yeah. Oh, Guillermo. So at least Guillermo got. <laughs> he's our underdog. Yeah. Yeah. And he's just. I feel like he's constantly just moving up, you know? Yeah. Cause I mean, before... he's like super prolific, right? Like, he's like a. I don't know. I feel like all of his stuff is like instant classic. Yeah. I mean, not to say that this is like a direct comparison, but like a lot of his stuff is like on Criterion now. Mm-hmm. And um, he just got like an Oscar, too, for Shape of Water. Yes. So I can't wait to watch Shape of Water. It's, yeah. It's, it's like. He he did three movies pretty much in like that called like his like trilogy like his fantasy like Mexico trilogy which is Chronos Devil's Backbone and then Pan's Labyrinth mm-hmm. yeah are, and I feel like Shape of Water is the closest to that because mm-hmm. then he has like his comic booky stuff with Blade two and the two Hellboy movies he did Blade he did the second Blade movie ooh Eric said every time we watch a Twilight movie we have to watch a Blade movie first. And that's a privilege for you. <laughs> I know. I might, that's take an up, honor. I might take him up on it. Honestly, <laughs> at this point, I'm... apparently they wrote this script right um, after Pan's Labyrinth in 2006, uh, but then it got delayed because of Hellboy 2. Eventually, he came around to making Crimson Peak. He is quoted as saying uh, that this movie is very specifically or uh, very set oriented, uh, classical, but at the same time modern take on ghosts. I can't wait. Uh, and he listed references to The Omen, The Exorcist, The Shining, The Haunting, and The Innocence. Oh, only those? The, the. Just kidding, fuck. <laughs> Why is it just called The Crimson or something? The Peak. <laughs> it sounds like a shock jock radio station. <laughs> Welcome to The Peak <laughs> with Guillermo <laughs> del Toro. When you say it's set-based, was it a soundstage, or did they build a house for this movie? Or is it CGI? A little bit of both. Okay. <laughs> 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 I think I was trying to do like a little bit of... <laughs> a little bit. Mambo number five. <laughs> um, no, they built like the entire house and most everything's built. There's only like limited CGI involved. Okay. So some yes. of it's soundstage, some of it's like location. Okay. But there's like a house already? No, they built the house. They built the house. They built the house. The house oh, that's that not CGI? No, no. 
Ooh. It's not as intricate as you think it is, though. Like, it's not like they built the entire mansion. Oh, sure. They probably well, just yeah. built, like, a facade outside and then, like, had sound stages. Like the Renaissance Festival. Wait, what? <laughs> it's like a real? facade, you oh. know? <laughs> no, you just... <laughs> <laughs> Wait, wait, the rest of us are still The Knights don't just literal. live in there? The Knights don't... You mean when I saw... They didn't die? They were alive still? They're still alive. <laughs> the men in mud don't live in that mud. No, they, that they actually... Mud? They're the exception. Okay. That's just a bad junction. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, okay so, so... Casting. Casting. Um, the stars Mia Wachowski, who's from Alice in Wonderland... Jane uh, Eyre, Jane, wow. a masterpiece. A masterpiece, there we go. What, what, what do you think about her? Amazing. Yeah, I think yeah, it's yeah. great. I like her. I like her face. Yeah. <laughs> She's right. very good She's at a looking protagonist. tortured. She's a protagonist's face. Yes, that's wow. true. This is a Mia household. It is. Do you like her? What do you think? All right. Oh, oh <laughs> it's not a Mia household. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get into it afterwards. It's a Mia household. Okay. Look at that. <laughs> uh, it was originally supposed to be Emma Stone. <laughs> That's so and dumb. Her giant mouth. No way. Come uh, on. Be like, a ghost. <laughs> <laughs> Conserve that memory, that image of my head. <laughs> Thank you. I was trying to like do it in my head, and I was like, oh, "There's no way to do it." And then you were looking at it. She was here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Fuck Emma Stone. I'll yeah, say it. I, I, I typically don't like bringing up actors who like, oh, it was supposed to be them or whatever. But like, it seems like it was. Slightly late in the game when she dropped out, and it was very late in the game for another actor to drop out. So, Thomas Hiddleston. What do we think about him? Um, I think he's overrated. Ooh. I mean, I was on Tumblr in, like, the uh, peak of horrible Tumblr Loki thirst. Yeah, it's just, like, pasty British boys. Yeah, him and Bendy Ben Cumberbund. Yeah. It's funny that you say that, because originally... <gasps> no! <laughs> I am just... <laughs> I am imagining the film <laughs> where it's Benedict Cumberbatch yeah. and... Emma Stone. Yeah. That makes it's no sense. It's viscerally upsetting to me. So think about that while you're watching this movie. It's so much mouth and then no mouth. Yeah. <laughs> Facial features and then no, they, they complete each other. Yeah, Emma Stone looks like the Snapchat filter where you get rid of the nose. Oh. It's just like big eyes. No, she's really pretty. I actually like Emma Stone much more than I've been dunking on her, but I don't think she can, ooh, act. <laughs> she's just what? no I really like her she's just talentless <laughs> I didn't say talentless she's just herself and everything she's in that's true uh, and in between these two uh, pasty people is another pasty person uh, Jessica Chastain I love her yes thank you I also I'll say it on this podcast I love it when actresses do not change their iconic noses okay she has an iconic nose calling out that actress from Dirty Dancing I see it yeah. bummer yeah. <laughs> Jennifer Grey tragic yeah. Yeah, love Jessica Chastain. She was in Mama. Uh, that was produced by Guillermo, so he liked her and put her in the movie as well. And spoilers, uh, Charlie Hunnam is in this movie as well after Pacific Rim, which was the movie that Guillermo did right before this movie. Ooh, we did a sneaky peek. Kidley and I watched the trailer. We both forgot Charlie Hunnam was in this movie, and we screamed we and screamed. screamed. and looked at each other and kept screaming. <laughs> and meanwhile, I'm driving over being like, man, I can't wait to review. Tell them that Charlie's here. Yeah. Oh. I can't believe he's doing an American accent. Yeah, why movie. didn't they let him Is be he not British? American? No, he's fucking British. He's British. Are you kidding me? I don't, Is he American? I've His always, American accent's horrible. Charlie Hunnam? Yes. But I've only seen him in Sons of Anarchy. It sounds like he's from Boston or like New or, York. He sounds like he's not British Robert either. Pattinson trying to do That's Edward. True. They all sound like Chicago. Like, like, let me tell you, man. I think there's like yeah, one, there's one, <laughs> there's one like dialect coach in London. And it's like a boss story. <laughs> He's like, yeah, I came over the sea. Oh, no, that's how... <laughs> He's always waiting. It's no. a real Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde situation over oh there. He just uh, hey. crouched in Eric's throat with like a little, hey. <laughs> Wait, hey, I'm why here. <laughs> so, uh, this movie took four mo- months to shoot, around uh, 68 days. Okay. Uh, which makes you ask. Just one more day. Why not? Why not one more pickup shot? <laughs> Why not like a little bit extra One time? One last day. <laughs> Come on, Guillermo. Wrap it up. Uh, and speaking of wrapping it up, so yeah, it, this movie is all sets. It's costuming. It's visual, visual, visual. That's all he was really like honing in on. But what he's also honing in on is storytelling because he felt like a lot of ghost stories and stuff like that had turned into cheap scares and B-movie kind of tropes. He wanted uh-huh. to yes. kind of bring it back to female gothic. Yes. Which is where Keely will begin with her note cards, Perfect. I well, I do have a question, Three, actually. Three, two, one, go for Katie Lee. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, Wait, no, let's <laughs> Okay, I have a question. Yeah. How long did the co- 
costuming department have? Was it only those, t- like, how much of a lead did they have? You might talk about the budget later. There was the video that I had shared with you guys where they had mentioned that they were on a pretty tight schedule. Yeah. I don't remember the actual timeline, but I'm assuming within 68 days, that's principal photography. I don't know how much pre-production was, but it seems like it was like a quickish turnaround for that much costuming. That's insane. The sleeves are actually 2D. It's just a cutout. It's a cardboard cutout. They're just, cut out. Out. <laughs> cut <laughs> they're just no. walking up. Yeah. I found various videos that we can dive into at some point or just share with you guys of how long you want to look at it because there's like a video that's like an hour long of them just breaking down every costume in this movie. Oh my god, I'm so excited to watch We're going to watch it after this. Yes. <laughs> after, after, after this. Okay, um, I am taking out my note cards. Wait. Oh. Hang what? on. Yes. What? Cumberbatch. What? Why did they drop? <laughs> um, wait! Why did they... We never... Yeah, why did he drop out? <laughs> I've killed Eric. Um, <laughs> no, Eric. I just... Oh. Wait. Cumberbatch! <laughs> why did he... Yeah, why did they drop out? They That's what Guillermo like said as Cumberbatch looked out the door. He's like, wait, Cumberbatch, no! <laughs> Oh, look, Thomas Edison. No, yeah, perfect. It probably serves us better. Uh, almost yeah, certainly. I think Ben and Cumberbatch would not have been as good for this role. Um, although Thomas Hiddleston did audition to be Thor. Why are you calling oh, him hey. Tom, Thomas Hiddleston? Is it just Tom? Is this a bit? Is it just Tom? No, it's yeah. Tom Hiddleston. Tom Hiddleston. <laughs> it's Tom Hiddleston. I don't feel like I know him well enough to call him Tom. <laughs> Wait, we didn't get your take on Tom Hiddleston. I think he's right. He's all right. Yeah, I don't really have a strong take. I liked him in a few things I've seen him in. I think he's good Loki. I think he was good in Only Lovers Left Alive. And I think he's good in this. Okay. Okay. And he seems like a fine gent. <laughs> I think I just associate him too strongly with Super Hulak. I think Hulag. that's the problem. It's the it's the Super Hulak. It's the Rick and Morty's out there where there's like a fan base that kind of just ruins those people. <laughs> it's all the people who think Rick is sexy. <laughs> <laughs> They ruined Rick and Morty. <laughs> Those objectifiers. More like, like Rick and Horty. <laughs> no! <laughs> All right, I regret asking. <laughs> he, no, so it's a mystery of why he left. Some say it deals with some aspects of this movie that I cannot reveal at this point in time. Ooh. Um, he didn't want to get his butt out. <laughs> was that it? No, actually, oh. that, that was Thomas Hillison. He was the one. He, he, Thomas! <laughs> Robert Pattinson. That's his full name. Oh, you don't call him that. <laughs> no, I call him Robbie Pats. <laughs> no. We buds. We, we go way back. It's like we call him Jake Gyllenhaal, Jakey G. <laughs> that is not a thing. <laughs> Wait, G. so you're saying Thomas Hiddleston got his whole ass out on his own? It was like, this is good? Yeah. Do you like this? There's a scene in this wow. movie where he was like, hey, you know how like, usually women are naked? I want to be naked. And Gamera was like, perfect. Let me see your butt. <laughs> 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 um, it's an audio medium, but Eric, you can imagine <laughs> the hand gesture <laughs> of moving the camera down to his buttocks. I thought, oh, you, I thought were you were moving your hand down his No, no, that was the camera. <laughs> <laughs> what Just wide of an ass? Right there. <laughs> My hands were like a fire. Why did the Kylo Ren is? <laughs> Man, I'm, I can't wait to meet Adam Driver one day and just give him a hug. <laughs> just extended his arms like a flying squirrel. <laughs> Bold of you all to assume this is staying in. <laughs> we got the after credit audio now, baby. Hair, same cut. <laughs> that's Carly's new ringtone. <laughs> just the C word over and over. It's like, oh, that's fine. <laughs> Gotta get it. Okay, all right, Kaylee. All right, so going into this, like, you know... What he's trying to do is very well researched. Mm-hmm. Um, we love a we love a researcher in this yeah. house. And he said directly that he was pulling mostly from gothic literature and like female specifically. Like she's straight up in a nightgown with a candelabra. Like right. fuck yes, yeah. yes, yes. So speaking of that, yes. <laughs> your second lead way to <laughs> here we go. So when I started my research about gothic fiction and how we got it, I thought. Mary Shelley's Frankenstein was going to kick us off in 1818. False! Ooh. It was actually some other guy. He was British. I did not write his name down, but he wrote a story, The Castle of Otranto in 1764. So the elements of 
gothic horror are we have our virginal maiden. Boo. She's innocent. She's beautiful. She wants to put others before herself. Okay, not booing for her. Booing for the concept of her. Yes. Um, we have sometimes an older, foolish, or overly submissive woman. We have the hero. And this is, granted, this is taken from British um, elements of gothic horror. So okay. American horror and gothic horror specifically had its own twist with like expansion into the West and things like that. Um, so anyway, number four, tyrant, uh, a villain or a predatory male. We've got some bandits and ruffians next on the list. Yes, ruffians. Mm. Yes, bandits. The clergy, because somehow they always yeah. get involved. And then usually like a really dark, like atmospheric setting, like a castle or a monastery. Something very secretive. Wow. Do you know the beginning of Moulin Rouge or like the middle part where they're trying to sell the shitty yeah. bad guy like on the plot yeah 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 that's what I feel like you just did he's <laughs> <laughs> just like why not no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> like exactly but <laughs> let me tell you about wow. British women authors so like the Brontes for example um, and Mary Shelley too they explored rage and repressed sexuality and definitely highlighted all those shitty dudes and um, oh. the feelings of like being trapped in their domestic roles shit so those are our elements of gothic horror. But I have prepared more notes for a historical context. So we have uh, romanticism, which leads us to gothic fiction and horror. But romanticism was an emphasis of um, directly opposed to the Enlightenment. So we have the Enlightenment first and the scientific revolution in like the 1600s and 1700s. Uh, it also forms like the, the basis of... Um, all of the sciencey stuff that was discovered and then put into like Frankenstein, for example, or like these, it's kind of like a reckoning of, oh my God, what have we done? We're advancing too quickly and this mm. is really scary. So romanticism also takes that and its peak is in 1800 to 1850 and then kind of dies out over the rest of the century, but definitely like they found their hits, they found their penny dreadfuls and they're like, produce more of this. Like, <laughs> so that continues on. Thank God. What else will we be doing? <laughs> Honestly, like, it's really interesting to see, like, from listening to your podcast about how their gothic horror really reflects their, their current time and how they were trying to grapple with all the trauma that everyone's going through at that point. We did not pay Katie Lee to plug the podcast that Thank she's you. a guest on. Hey, Well, it's almost, it sounds like when you're going through all like, the elements, too, of gothic horror, it feels like we're going through, like, a slasher formula, too. A little bit. Yeah. Like your virginal set piece. and then the yeah. hero Why is it the... always that, gang? It just has been forever. Do you guys have context for horror movies in other cultures and if the tropes are the same? Um, to a limited degree. Yeah, um, it's like, not me! But <laughs> typically it is it is slightly different. It is very Western and European of the like hero and virginal maiden. Got it. Although, wait, no. Take that back. Never mind. Because, like, you know, Japanese, a lot of Japanese horror deals with, like, um, it's very, like, mystical and ghostly oriented. Uh -huh. And usually the ghosts are, like, it's people who've experienced some sort of trauma or loss that creates their soul to stay, and it's usually females. Okay. So that's, like, you get from traditional ghost stories to, like, modern day of, like, the grudge and the ring. Yeah. So it kind of it ke keeps on, like, continuing of these, like, vengeful, wronged female spirits. So it's almost, Ooh. it almost makes them the villain versus the ones who are, like, who eventually become, like, the final girl heroine. What did you say? You said that in Men, Women, and Chainsaw, she says that women are the vessel of evil. Yeah, so when it goes into, for that's just for like a law of our like American and European yeah. context, mm -hmm. the that women are viewed as like portals or openings to well, like life. that goes back to fucking original sin, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. yeah. So it's just kind of constantly viewed as that. And there's some sort of like empowerment to it, but then it's like with Men, Women, Chainsaws, we're also going into like the one sex and so it's not defined by men and women it's defined by masculine and feminine mm -hmm. and so even though that the final girl is a woman typically she is showing masculine traits that is how she succeeds is by becoming masculine mm. is the in romanticism is like the tragedy and the woman being i'm thinking of dracula too ending is like you don't know if she's bad or good and you're like wait shit she is bad dun, dun. that's the end that's the whole point is that she's the only like bravest goodest the bravest, goodest girl. Because they're that. also grappling with, like, Victorian England and all of the repressed sexuality and all yeah. of the insane pressure put on women in the time, too. Yeah. There's um, a lot that I want to get into, too, about this, but I need to wait for yeah. the movie. That's what that article... I found a really good article 
that was like an academic study on Crimson Peak. Mm-hmm. And it ties Ooh. a lot to Ooh. Yeah. There's also a lot of, I don't know if this comes up in Crimson Peak, and I hope it does, but a lot of homoeroticism in Gothic horror, mm. which reminds me of The Lost Boys. <laughs> just like, make out. I feel like so there's true. no dudes in this movie, really. It's just Hiddles and his sister and her. Romanticism is focusing on emotional and um, like those, especially in visual art, like the facial expressions and um, the pursuit of pleasure and whatever it means to be sublime or experience the sublime. Um, and it is a direct response to the stress and fears of the Industrial Revolution. And as I was doing my research, I was like, huh, I think I would argue this is a direct response to the expansion of the British Empire also. How it goes is um, it, there are two different theories. It's like, okay, as we're expanding across the globe and finding different corners of the earth, now we need something spooky because the world is not spooky anymore. It's so it's so big, but we know it. Um, but then there's also this idea of um, reacting to the trauma and horrors of the Industrial Revolution, the wealth gaps between the ruling class and all the people who were super mm. poor, um, all of the reactions from the people who were colonized and brutalized by the British Empire, scary stories coming out of, you know, England's expansion into Africa that ultimately failed, um, things like that. So Wow, you're so smart. No, oh, that was great. Wow. I was really nerding out around this, so hence my millions We're just of sitting here like, wow. <laughs> so from that, romanticism comes because they want to like really idealize the ye old days. So they go back to, oh, medievalism. And oh my like, God, it's like the people who are like, God, I wish it was the 50s. Yes. <laughs> Ew. There's so many parallels to right now. Like I was just like totally nerding out the entire time. I was just thinking about how like all I, you know, in the quarantine times, all you have to do is wear a fancy shirt and eat some grapes and lounge and yeah. yearn. Yeah. It's kind of all we have going on. So much yearning. You know? So that makes so sense. So many grapes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's a little time <laughs> Quick note on politics that were shaping the region. So um, just the world in general. So we have just so much trauma from this time. So we have the Scottish uprisings and the clans that get absolutely murdered uh, at the Battle of Culloden, which is in 1745 and 1746. So that predates our Castle of Otranto story. Then we have the French Revolution, a series of revolutions in Spain, the major one in 1868 that installed their constitution. Um... The Great Famine in Ireland, and... Oh my god, this is all at the same time? Literally, yes, Ooh, within that century. That and then feels almost, familiar. Yes, and then almost a million <laughs> people, um, a million Indian people were killed in the Indian Rebellion of 1857. Yo, a million people killed in a rebellion? In a rebellion in 1857, and that's because of both the mass murders and the um results of it so like famine and jesus christ yeah so wow everyone stop complaining about 2020 yes and that's only (laughs) one uprising there were multiple indian uprisings as england was expanding that way so there's a lot coming out of um all of these countries obviously it's been changed for the british and they're like oh like something so scary these other people and um that's so funny that british self-reflection is not oops atrocities it's yeah. maybe it's actually the scary thing is not us it is ghosts like yeah. they can't <laughs> they can't be like we fucked up it's like no no it's something else yeah seriously um so the other the other main piece of that that really sh- shaped up the century was spiritualism so that's when we see like the iconic scene in penny dreadful with the séance and mediums and talking to spirits and oh, like tarot was, too. Tarot, yeah. So What's it basically Alistair Crowley. Yeah, that motherfucker. Yeah. So it that opens the door for the boom of occultism in England and then the development of Wicca in the nineteen hundreds. And then uh, just a quick note on, on Victorians and death. We see them as obsessed with Memento Mori, but mourning was just a huge, huge part of their lives. I have a pop quiz for you guys. Ooh, no Wow, a quiz. I don't know anything. Average lifespans in Victorian England. Two. 40. Two. Upper, cla- upper class men. How old do you think they live to be? 35. Whoa. At least 50. 44. Oh. If you were a tradesman, how long do you think you'd live? 30. 35. 25. Oh. <gasps> you, you lived were... to be 25? 25. You'd be dead. Okay. And if you're a laborer, how long do you think you'd live? Then like 12. 22. Okay. 
Oh, three years. Right. Um, and 57 out of every 100 working class children died before the age of five. Yikes. Yeah. So it's a bad time. So the Victorians really compensated for all of the loss that they were going My through. My jaw is dropped. Yeah. It's awful. And it only really improves when the advent of photography becomes more widespread so they can cause an uproar over how these people uh, are the working suffering. Class. Well, I guess I, it's funny. We complain now. It's like, oh, overpopulation. Humans aren't meant to live like that. It's like, no, humans weren't meant to live like that. Yes. <laughs> that one. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Thank you, photography, too, for doing something. Yes, thank you, journalists. Yeah, next, Seriously. Next thank time. you, Upton St. Clair. Yeah. <laughs> Upton St. Clair. He's the guy who wrote The Jungle. Um, he exposed the meatpacking industry. And um, I was just fucking around. Yeah. I know one thing, and it's yeah. that. The Victorians ritualized their mourning, so they would keep lockets with the dead person's hair in it. They would do post-mortem photography, which I think you guys are probably already familiar with. That so is, creepy. You prop up the dead person. Mm-hmm. But, and open their eyes. Um, I also learned about something called a death mask, mm-hmm. which is when you make a plaster mold of the dead person's face so that you can paint it in a p- portrait as if they were living. I like that. It's creepy. Um, Don't look in the closet. And then also they were just... Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, they just really had to cope through really awful things, and it's really yeah. similar to us. Consuming horror, mm. true crime, mm. serial killers, mm. because yeah. they had Penny Dreadfuls, Jack the Ripper hit London, and it went absolutely media frenzy in 1888, and then public hangings were like huge events that people would like oh, bring God. snacks to, and there was a huge uh, stampede actually that killed like 20 people. Oh my God, imagine going to see someone else get executed and be like, suckers! Yeah, and then you get trampled, <laughs> like, Ugh. okay. I wasn't supposed to be the one who died. Yeah. So, um, in summary, it was a bad time for, and we obviously like, we don't have the full, the, the British government destroyed all of their atrocity documents in their empire, so we're missing a bunch of that, so that's not counted. Obviously, the deaths in the stats that I was giving you, deaths of women are not counted. People of color are not counted either. Fuck! So you can assume that it would be much lower for everyone considering childbirth. Oh, man, I'm just imagining everyone in The Witch, too, just bailing to America to try to be better, and then shit's bad over there, too. And then they just the make devil's more bad still stuff. still in America. Uh, yeah. yeah. Ooh, that's a, that's a good title. The Ooh. Devil's Still in America. Yeah. <laughs> I think that... Yeah, that's we, we talked about that on The Witch a lot, too. Like, how the witches were just a way to make sense of the mm-hmm. senselessness of life. So, it's funny, though, that it would turn to, like, luxury and romanticism. And, like, dandyism and, like, you know, yeah. like, fancy boy. I mean, like, that's what we're, like, at now, too. Like, not only are we consuming a lot of horror, but, like, reality show and, like, kids. Yeah. yeah. It's time. It's time. I must read the wiki. <gasps> oh, Let's now it's time paint. for Jamie. Now it's time for you. I know, you I know. Fuck around. Super <laughs> long. Now I got my bit done first, so then I can just fuck Don't worry. Out. I just have a paragraph, and it's pretty inconsequential after Katie Lee gave us a world history AP class lesson. <laughs> yes! Hey. Fucking <gasps> bravo. Hey, yeah, it was rad. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Crimson Peak is a 2015 gothic romance film. Yes, it Ooh. is. <laughs> Directed by Guillermo del Toro and written by del Toro and Matthew Robbins. Who's Matthew Robbins? He's just a dude. All right. The film stars Mia Wachowski. No, Wachowska? Wachowski? It's it's spelled... See? I think it's Wachowska, but like it's, I want to say Matt Was- Wachowski. W- Wassy Cow... Wassy... <laughs> Wassy Cow... Wach- <laughs> it's spelled W-A-S-I-K. <laughs> Mia Wachowski. I like being on this side. <laughs> Thomas Hiddleston. <laughs> Mia Wachowski, Thomas Hiddleston, Jessica <laughs> Jason, stop, Charlie Hunnam, and Tim Beaver. <laughs> the story set in Victorian era England follows an aspiring author who travels to a remote Gothic mansion in the English hills with her new husband and his sister. There she must decipher the mystery behind the ghostly visions that haunt her new home. What could go wrong? Nothing. We'll find out. <laughs> yeah, see? That's what you guys get. You guys both had much longer bits. <laughs> All I did is read the wiki. I'm just showing up today. <laughs> We're at an hour. Do you have any final uh, uh, comments, concerns, Jamie? No. <laughs> no. Eric? I'm ready for some... No. <laughs> I'm ready for Thomas Hiddleston. I'm ready for poofy sleeves. I'm ready for mood lighting. Oh, yes. Beware. Ooh. Beware of crim 
Wings and Peak. Nice. So maybe this is a good note before the movie is that to go into it thinking of it as a gothic romance. The reviews when it first came out were very divisive because it was kind of mismarketed as a horror ghost movie. Yeah. And that's what I went into like view it as. It's like a cool Guillermo ghost horror movie. The amount of ghost and horror elements to it, when they're there, they are there and they're very prominent and they're very spooky. Yes. But they are not the focus of the movie. Mm-hmm. And Guillermo loves his monsters and wants to treat them with all the respect. So often the monsters aren't even the scary parts of the movie. Hmm. So that's all good to mm-hmm. really makes you think. keep in the back of your mind. Sometimes they're the romantic interest, like in Shape of Water. Sometimes the real monsters were the ones that we made out with along the way. <laughs> <laughs> hey y'all, it's time for content warnings, but big warning up front, there's a huge spoiler in one of the content warnings, so skip ahead if you're watching along with us in real time, uh, unless you feel like you need the, the content warning, so... Content warnings for Crimson Peak are head injury, bugs, close-ups of bugs, um, ghost stuff, and the big warning here is for incest. Thanks again to Katie Lee for getting spooky with us this week. Since it's our job and your job to make the world a little less horrific, she chose our cause this week, which is the Navajo Hopi Solidarity Fund. It started up this year to help Native people who are being hit the hardest by COVID in our native state of Arizona. We'll link to their site and all of the articles we discuss in the second half here in the show notes. Okay, let's get into it. Katie, what did you think? I loved it. It was so good. It was so tasty. You and I both at the end went, what a treat. We (laughs) both... (laughs) It was everything I ever wanted it to be. Oh, that's good to... That, we never... When did we hear that? What? When do you hear it's everything I ever wanted it to be? Oh, me? In a never. movie. Oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, like, just a, I'm just like at least this. twice. This is a delight. <laughs> I, was, I was not disappointed. I really hyped it up for myself. I hyped it up for you two and not disappointed. I wasn't either. It was it was a lot more I don't know it was more it was it was a lot different than I thought it was going to be. Yeah, and it is interesting because it like it does harken back to the the gothic literature style of changing viewpoints and like putting things together with clues and yeah. newspaper clippings. This is a spoilers. This is a Call of Cthulhu game. Yeah, for like, sure, a hundred percent. And it also is. very similar to like the plot of Dracula. Yeah. <laughs> like, no, newspaper clippings. We'll figure this out. <laughs> but before we really get into it, what we really need to have happen, so that way we can just get past this whole spoiler shenanigans as we oh, call it boy jamie you need to recap the movie give us the recap i'll, I'll, I'll top you off real quick with a tagline uh love a uh, love makes monsters of all of us Ooh, of us all <laughs> <laughs> you want to try that again <laughs> love makes monsters <laughs> crimson peak love <laughs> makes monsters of us all all right <laughs> so <laughs> We have our protagonist. Her name is Edith. She is writing a book. Her dad is <laughs> a man who is a businessman of some kind. Oil rig man? Machinery? Something. And uh, Industrialization. Charlie Hunnam is in it and he has the hots for Edith and he's an optometrist and a doctor. He's a wonderful himbo. That really went nowhere. The ghost thing, like people can see, go- like his ghost yeah. tech. That was just to explain the appearance of the ghosts. Oh. Because he was saying that it's like in the soil, and like in the dirt that people reside. Yeah. And all the ghosts were red because of the red. Yeah, dirt. I didn't catch that at all. Okay. Okay. <laughs> there is a mysterious <laughs> British sibling pair who show up and they're trying to get financing for a clay harvesting project yeah, mining too, thing. They're not too sharp. Their last name is Sharp. <laughs> Eric's very pleased <laughs> with himself. You guys cannot gang up on me on this summary. I won't, I won't, I won't. You can't. You better not. You. Both of you. <laughs> <laughs> um... And he asks Edith's dad for money, and Edith's dad is like, I don't like the cut of your jib and your soft, fancy, mansy, bansy boy hands. They do hold hands for a very long time. They do hold hands. I don't like how you kiss. (laughs) For a very long time? I wish they did. All right, all right. (laughs) Okay. Um, It was funny when you 
said they don't have chemistry because I felt like he and Charlie Hunnam had a little bit of that chemistry. Yeah. They had a little bit more heat. Yes. I mean, who doesn't? Like he like st- tells him where to stab him. It's like, are we about to kiss? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I'm watching too much Hannibal. But okay. That's the vibe. It was, oh, thank you. All right. Okay. Um, so she, there's a uh, very erotic waltz scene <laughs> where Tom Hiddleston has taken his sights upon our protagonist, Edith. And uh, let me tell you, it was incredible. The costuming, superb. They danced with a candle in their hands. It was delightful. Why did they do that? It's goth. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> and Charlie Hunnam is like, oh no. And because um, he is in love with Edith. And then t- the dad has a private investigator find um, find some dirt on these Brits. Dirt. <laughs> <laughs> Some red dirt. <laughs> and um, he tells them, he gives them money and he's like, I need you to be gone in the first morning train and I need you to break my daughter's heart. So then Tom Hiddleston has this whole big speech about how her writing sucks and she sucks and all this stuff. And, he and has she wants been, love. Yeah, and, and she's like dumb. And she, they keep calling foolish. her a child. So I want to know how old she is. She's probably like 18. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then she slaps him. And then um, he leaves. <laughs> no folly work, please. <laughs> um, he leaves, and then she catches up with his stop. She catches up with his train. Nothing now. Very quiet over there, huh? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> catches up with his. Uh, Eric's gonna edit this episode for the first time, and it's gonna be really fun for him. It's not like we're an hour and nine minutes in. Am I- we're 15 minutes into the recap of the two-hour movie. Oh, no. <laughs> um, she catches up to the train with him, basically, and they're like, we are in love with each other. Meanwhile, the dad is at his fancy club man barber shop and um, gets his head absolutely bashed in on a sink. Just absolutely. Like, you see it. It's gnarly. Um, Lots of flowing water with blood in it. Yeah. Dad is dead. Um, And then Edith has to identify the body, and then she crumples back in grief into Tom Hiddle's arms. Hard cut to the funeral, and she is wearing a ring that we saw the sister wearing before. Um, And Tom Hiddleston was wearing little goth sunglasses and told the sister he needs the ring from her. And she's like, no, I don't want to give you the ring. And she's like, well, I want it back. And so he takes the ring from his sister and then proposes to Edith. Hard cut. I was really shook. Hard cut to the manor. It's this giant, enormous, crazy fucking house, and there's a hole in the fucking ceiling, and it's snowing through it. Mm -hmm. And they're like, it's our old shitty house. We have to keep it up here. We don't have any money. And um, there's a bunch of ominous tea and a bunch of big, big sleeves. And she keeps having nightmares. She starts coughing up blood. She starts seeing ghosts in the house. She keeps being like, Thomas, ghost. And he's like, Wah! And she keeps waking up in the middle of the night and he's not there. And where is he? Mm. Mm. And um, the sister, <laughs> the sister has the keys to the house and she like won't let her in it. And she won't let her look around. She won't give her a set of keys to the house. And there's like a power struggle going on there. And then um, they're like manservant Finley. Um, he's like, oh, look, this is my wife. He's like, yeah, I know. You've already been, you've been married a long time. She's like, what? He's like, ha nothing. And then a dog pops up out of nowhere and they're like, where's that dog? Oh, that's weird. And so she takes the dog and then there's side conversations and the dog, he's like, I put the dog out into the wilderness to die. And it's like, okay. So that's Tom Hiddleston talking to the sister. Yes. Um, and there's like these film canisters. What were those? They're just they like rubber. The, the recordings, the wax recordings for the grandma. I didn't. Phone. Okay, got it, got it. So they have those as well. Um, basically, Edith steals a key from the sister's keychain, and she's able to find the recordings. Am I missing anything? I know it's moving fast, but like uh, she I, finds the recordings first because a ghost leads her there. Thanks, ghosts. Yeah, and ghosts then, have been helpful throughout. Yeah. Yes, they keep warning her. Oh, she saw her mom's ghost. Yeah. She's been able to see ghosts. She initially, in the very beginning of the film, it starts out with her seeing her mom's ghost, warning her, beware of Crimson Peak. And then Tom Hiddleston was like, it's convenient that he is Tom and Thomas. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. <laughs> filmmakers. Good thing um, that doesn't confuse anybody. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, he's, he, he says that the nickname for the manor is Crimson Peak, and she's like, oh, fuck. And it's because the clay is red. Um, in the ground and they're trying to harvest the clay 
Um, and then she finds these vats under the house and they're filled with this like crazy bubbling red liquid. She stirs it and nothing happens. Um, I called it maiden goop. And then a body bloops up from the bottom. And so, but she doesn't see it. And then we see the um, ghost of her mom. All not these her canisters mom. are locked underground. Like they're, mm-hmm. they're, the ghosts are like held prisoner. Yeah. And the, um, well, I don't know about that, but the canisters are there. Yeah. Um, and the mom... The, she sees the ghost of the mom of the two siblings. Um, it sucks. It's gross. And so basically she finds out that they keep... He... Thomas keeps marrying people. He keeps marrying women, taking their fortunes. They're being poisoned by the tea, and then they die. And then... Horrible deaths. Horrible deaths. And um, there was a baby. There's, like, photographs. There The dog belonged to one of the women. And she's like, I need to get the fuck out of here. And so then she runs away, but then she's really weak. And then she passes out. And then they, like, have her in bed. And, um, oh, her and Tom Hiddleston fuck at the post office. Yeah, the most important scene. (laughs) They keep trying to, she keeps trying to fuck him. And he's like, I don't know. And then the sister keeps, like, weirdly interrupting them. Well, not weirdly. She keeps barging in anytime. And then um, they go to the post office and they stay overnight. And then we see Tom Hiddleston's butt. And then Save they come the back. USPS. <laughs> That's how we do it, folks. <laughs> Liberals, you heard me. <laughs> um, Save it with ass. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, they get home and then the sister, like, finds out. And then she chucks a fucking pan at her and, like, flips out at her. She just um, slams the a, a pot of eggs on the table that's all it was and it scoops them with their hands and like maybe the weirdest like this creepiest is detail gross. just like squishing scrambled eggs between I've her fingers I've never seen anybody hold scrambled eggs in my I life. hated it I don't want I anyone did. to hold them Charlie Hunnam is coming for her um because he talks to the PI back in America and it turns out that the mom well okay this is what is revealed the mom was murdered by having her head bashed in and like a hatchet in her head and it was this horrible thing and there were two kids who lived in the house and we find out that the parents are abusive um the mom beat the kids all the time the dad broke the mom's leg so like the dad spent all of their money and fortune and whatever um the sister is older than the brother and then we don't know what happened so he got sent to boarding school when he was a kid and she got sent to Said a convent, but like, nah. We like an institution. Nudge, nudge. It's yeah. pretty much yeah. like a mental, yeah, mental ward, yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know how they got out. <laughs> um, but Charlie Hunnam, nope, Charlie Hunnam is not there yet, but he is mid route. And then, how did that scene happen? You got there, though. Because when she, she hears, she hears singing, she like wakes up, she hears singing. And she goes yeah. and finds the singing, and the source of the singing is Jessica Chastain and Tom Hiddleston in there making out, um, and Nakey ish. The the ghost with the baby points her in the direction That's to the hidden right. door. That's right. That's right. Okay. There's a hidden door covered in moths. It felt very Suspiria y. Um, and then Jessica Chastain's like, all right, game time, motherfucker. Let's do it. And then she's like, I knew you weren't a sister. And what did she say? Which you always know in any sort of like. I don't know, a film like this or whatever, once the hair comes down, it's like about to get serious. Yes, because Jessica Chastain this whole time is very buttoned up and she's these like crazy high collars and like crazy hair, like really tight. And then her hair is down. She's wearing big old sleeves. And um, what does she say? She says like, oh, how lovely. He is my brother. And then she shoves her off of like a banister and then she hits another banister and then she lands in a convenient pile of snow. Mm -hmm. And then we are banging on the door that banging on the door is charlie hunnam and she wakes up and he's like oh i had to heavily sedate you because you broke your legs or whatever your legs are hurt and then um he's like they offer him tea and then he, he's trying to get her to drink tea and then she's like i saw my mom ghost she warned me and then charlie hunnam's like i need a moment alone and then he's like i'm getting you the fuck out of here yes charlie hunnam so he picks her up and they're trying to leave and then classic mistake no one is ever sneaky enough they're like, oh, we're leaving right now. And I'm like, yeah. be a little more sneaky. No, I know they didn't have time. She was going to die. And they're just grandly just going to be like, toodles. I mean, yeah, because then Charlie Hunnam. These murderous siblings. Yeah, well, that's the thing, because Charlie Hunnam been... reveals everything I just revealed to you. Yeah, he could have been like, oh, I left something in my car. Outside. My horse car. My horse. My horse. So um, they're trying to leave, and he's like, yeah, 
you two are fucking crazy. Bye. And then Jessica Chastain's like, yup, and stabs him in the armpit artery. And so then she <laughs> stabs him in the Mother, armpit. He's Another good yeah. name, yeah. Yeah. Armpit artery. Um, and then she's like, why don't you do some fucking work for once and give Tom Hiddleston the knife. And then Tom Hiddleston and Charlie Hunnam have their are they gonna kiss moment. And he's like, you're a doctor. Tell me where to do it. And then he points at his tummy and then he stabs him and then he falls over and then she's like, you're monsters! And they're like, yeah. Um, and then so the dog, dog death. Oh um, yeah, and then they killed the dog. Um, it happens off screen. We muted it. I was just like, oh man, I thought the dog was gonna make it on this one. Nope, I'm an idiot. Um, I forgot this movie's rated R. Huh? It's because they say fucking once. Well, there's a little PG thirteen. Yeah, no, that's why, right? Yeah, yeah, that has to be it. Yeah. I just it doesn't feel like it was the setup. Didn't feel like it was rated R. It does uh, outside of the gore scenes. It doesn't really. I guess, yeah. I oh, guess, no, man. no, probably the incest stuff. Oh, on the sex scene. Yeah, it's R. I guess it's R, baby. It's booty cheeks. <laughs> it was booty cheeks. <laughs> it was booty cheeks. Um, so then shit goes wild. Basically, Edith is taken upstairs to um, sign the papers away to her dad's fortune. Jessica Chastain snips her hair off and braids it and puts it in her creepy box of other braided hair of the other woman. And, um, Memento Mori, everyone. Ooh. Ooh, I get it. And then uh, <laughs> Tom Hiddleston takes Charlie Hunnam down to the maiden goop chamber and is like, oh. okay, just wait down here. I'm going to go get her. It'll be fine. And then Charlie Hunnam's like, I don't really have a lot of options. So he stays down there. And then back upstairs, um, Edith kind of goads at her a little bit. And she says, well, like, calls it like a house of horrors and like these horrible things. And then she says this crazy line. It's like, but the horror... The horror was for love. The things we do for love like this are ugly, mad, full of sweat and regret. The sweat part, I was like, okay. The, this love burns you and maims you and twists you inside out. It is a monstrous love and it makes monsters of us all. And I was like, thesis. And end the movie. End of movie. And then we find out that the baby, the ghost baby, was not the baby of one of the women because she's like, yeah, he never fucked any then. It was my baby. And then the baby died. Um... Well, I think she killed, the woman killed the baby. Yeah. Yeah. Um, she said she could make it better, and then... And then she killed it. Yeah. Um, and so then Edith has only her nightgown, her wits about her, and a pen her dad gave her at the very beginning. And she signs the papers, and then she stabs Jessica Chastain in the sternum and books it. Pen's and then than the sword. Ooh! Or the, <laughs> the shovel. shovel. <laughs> 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 okay, no, no, pen is mightier than the sword, but the shovel is mightier. Rock beats scissors, <laughs> shovel beats. Pen. Skull. Ah, um, well, that's true. <laughs> um, so, um, there is a nightgown fight with blood and stabbing it's through incredible. the house. They run down the stairs. It was wild. It's flowy, bloody, snow. Incredible. Not snow yet, because she goes to the elevator, and <laughs> she goes to the elevator, and then Tom Hiddles is like, okay, hey, She's like, you poisoned me. He's like, yep. She's like, you lied to me. He's like, yep. And she's like, you said you love me. He's like, I do love you. Um, I'm going to go fix it. Just wait right here. I'll be right back. And she waits. And then he goes and talks to his sister. And he's like, we could leave this place and um, all be together. And then she's like, all together? What? And I was, he just wanted a sister wife situation because he loves Edith. And she's like, you promise not to love anyone other than me. And stabs him. With, is it a, it's a knife. It's just a normal okay, knife. Yeah. Knife. Stabs him in the chest a few times and then stabs him in the fucking face. Um, like in his cheekbone. And then he pulls the knife out and then his eyeball starts bleeding. And then she's like, oh no. Did he I cries a bloody that? tear. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like one bloody tear. And then she clutches him and he dies. And then she's like, okay, now it's big murder time. Mm-hmm. So then, um, the nightgown fight resumes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they end up going outside. It's snowing. The clay is coming up through the ground, so it looks like there's blood yeah, everywhere. They go to the basement first because she gets the the cleaver. Oh, that's right. They go to the basement. They go to the what it, we've been calling it the maiden goop chamber. So why stop now? <laughs> they go down there, and then she's like, "I have a memento from mother," and then pulls the cleaver out of the floor, so and it's big. the so biggest cleaver you've ever seen. Big, like as big as your thigh. She did not get to use it. I know. Yeah. Someone should have used it. An arm should be not there anymore. Yeah. Ooh. Like, just, like, chop, chop. 
jab jab motherfuckers so then then we are in the snow fight it yes. shit's crazy shit's wild um she edith gets loses her, oh yeah edith they're at like a standstill they're both like holding each other's wrists basically and then um jessica chastain slips her hand onto the blade of the the knife and just pulls down and pulls it out of her grasp from the blade side and then it was a power move and she's like i'm not gonna stop until i kill you or you kill me and then edith gets a shovel and then she's like hey turn around and look at him and then she does and it's the ghost of her brother um I thought that effect was really good. And Tom Hiddles is there and she's like, oh, Thomas. And then she's like, what? And hits her in the head with the shovel. And then um, she says, I'm not going to stop until she says it again. And then she smacks her again with the shovel definitively. Her head caves in and she says, I heard you the first time. Mm-hmm. Yes, bitch. And then um, the the story started with her saying, I know ghosts are real and her crying in the nightgown in the snow. And then it cut to that part again. And then her and Charlie Hunnam limp on out And a rescue party has come to meet them. And then it cuts into the house and shots of the house. And then we see Jessica Chastain's ghost sitting at her piano. The end. Crimson Peak! What a good fucking movie. I forgot about how much of this movie is just her being like, um, something is wrong. (laughs) For like an hour and... Suss the movie. Suss the movie. Uh, Incestuous. (laughs) Incestuous the movie. So I asked... So here's what I thought. I had... I knew there was an incest thing. But it's also very clear in the movie. Because literally, like, he walks in in the first scene when they do their erotic waltz. Um, They walk in and Jessica Chastain's face lights up and then she sees her and her face just like... Yeesh. Like, it's all... This was Jessica Chastain's movie. Oh, yeah. Also, she just ate it up. She the whole great. thing. Yeah. It was great. Um, I knew that, and I thought they I thought they were ghosts. I thought they'd been dead. And I thought the photographs were going to be like, we've been dead for a hundred years! That'd be crazy. But, like, ghosts can't travel. <laughs> ghosts can't go in a carriage. They don't get a vacation. You don't get a fuck at the UPS store. <laughs> That's not true, folks. <laughs> Anybody could fuck at the UPS store. <laughs> Keep them alive. <laughs> oh. oh, okay. So I really, so I have some questions, Eric. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so like, they literally were just getting money to try fix the thing. I thought there was going to be like a sacrifice element. Like they were sacrificing the women to like appease the ghost in the house or something. Oh, yeah. That's what I thought when she said, y- "You don't know what they would do to us." I thought the reason why they were stuck in the house is like they had to. They had to, like, make the ghosts happy. That's what I thought. But they is, like, the man. Yeah. Okay. I guess I didn't have a question. <laughs> I just thought there would be... So the, the ghosts are just the women living... Like, everyone killed in the house. And then the... Could you talk about the what Charlie Hunnam said as an optometrist? We mentioned oh, it earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like what he said in the beginning was, like, setting up the point, which never, like, physically comes into play again yeah. but it, like sets up the theme of like why there's these ghosts and why they appear this way is because he says like oh look at my photographs there's like residual ghost people in the background it's because like of the Wild. dirt and stuff in like the photographs that cause them to like mm-hmm. imprint on the photos and so that's why like later on when you see all the ghosts they're all like goopy red crimson ghosts because the ground itself is all red that's rad and so they're like kind of like manifesting from that mm-hmm. um but i think it's also associated with their deaths because um, the mom is black because she died from like the black lung or whatever. That's right. The mom, know. and when we say the mom, we mean Edith's mom, not yeah. the not the sharp mom. It might be. It also, now that I'm saying it out loud, it might be the representation of what type of ghost they are, mm-hmm. because mm. Jessica Chastain appears the same way at the end of the movie. Ooh. So what I'm thinking, because what she does at the end of the movie too is explains why there's different types of ghosts, because some die from tragic incidents, some die. Or, like, some some become ghosts because of tragic instances. Some die because of strong emotional stuff. Mm-hmm. And that's why they stay around. So I'm assuming her mom stayed around because of her strong emotional connection to her daughter to warn yeah. her about the future. Jessica's chance saying became a ghost because of her strong emotional connection to her brother. The ghosts who are all red stayed around because they all had a tragic, like, incident happen to them. So that's why they all look the same. What about Hiddles? He came back for, like, true love. So, like, he was the white ghost. Although it's weird because... Uh, there's a movie called The Devil's Backbone, which is an earlier Guillermo del Toro movie, and that ghost in this movie has like the exact same design as him. Hmm. 
Maybe it was a callback, like a fun Easter egg. I think it was like a callback because he really likes that design. But I think there is like something about like you know the white savior kind of thing. Disgusting. Yeah. <laughs> we do not stand <laughs> in this podcast house. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's why there's ghosts. Is that what it was? That's good shit. No, oh. that was it. I thought I thought there was gonna be some kind of like. So they were literally just staying at the house for no fucking reason, just because they were like codependent. I think, yeah, I think it, it's like it shows. The level, because it's like the house is crumbling down because that's like a metaphor yeah. for like their like relationship. Is because it's like this incestuous thing that shouldn't happen. That's like like started in the past and they keep on trying to push it forward, but it's like obviously not. Yeah, mm-hmm. and it's it's both of them trying to um, <laughs> figure out how to keep that going. Like he's an inventor and she's fighting people to rope in and murder. <laughs> like they're yeah. both, like, like they're both like bad at what they're trying also, to do. Also, why didn't they just choose Charlie Hunnam's shitty sister? Why would they have to choose her? Because I thought it would be like their purity well, of no, soul. That's, that's, why I think, that's why I think the sister doesn't like the girl because that's who they She's want. She's too perceptive. Yeah, because he yeah. keeps saying, you're not like other girls. You're different. Ew! <laughs> I think he fell for her when he wasn't supposed to. I think he yeah. wasn't supposed to go okay. after her. Yeah, that so tracks. Perceptive. I thought that was like they were choosing like the best, purest, not like other girl girls. Like, I thought there was going to be some kind of, like, a sacrificial element. And I am i don't know if I'm disappointed if there was or wasn't. It was just an expectation I had going into the movie, and it wasn't. Mm-hmm. Thoughts from Kaylee. Yeah, you what you say, got? I, I just yeah, really baby. loved it. <laughs> <laughs> it was so good. And I i mean, I do wish that... I, I, I don't know. I think that the angle with the photography was underdeveloped. Oh! <laughs> The setup did take, it was a little bit of a slow burn to get going, but I think that's pretty typical of this type of story. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. The the ghosts were, they were great. Loved them. Uh, I think it's interesting to see the different type of um, resentment from the women in the movies. So, like, mm. Edith is like, oh, take me seriously as a writer. You don't take me seriously because of my handwriting. You're pandering or you're not. Um, and she's trying to strike out on her own, and then there's the, and she resents that, and then um, Jessica Chastain. We got to figure out her, what her name is. What is her name in the movie? Lucille. Lucille. Is it? Um, Lucille Thomas and Edith. Yeah. So and Lucille Hunnam. and Charlie Hotcakes. <laughs> <laughs> Charlie <laughs> Hotcakes. What the fuck was his name? <laughs> Charlie. Alan. Alan. Yeah. Good work. Why does this sound like you're making these up? Like, I feel like I'm not, like, <laughs> the names just did not register in my head. And Derek and Bethany. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> um, Greg. But Lucille has the resentment for having to take care of her abusive mother and having to go through all of that abuse and still be standing in the end. <laughs> wow. <laughs> no, don't let them in. No, okay. absolutely not. Okay. No. <laughs> no. Um, yeah, I can't, I mean, she obviously groomed her brother, too. Yeah. Because she's like, the only love we knew was together, mm-hmm. but she was 14 when they killed the mom and he was 12. I thought the way that they were talking, I thought that they were something literally tying them to the house. They didn't want to face the consequences of their actions. Uh, but wait, they didn't wait, wait. have to do them when he's like we can just move literally anywhere I was like wait like the whole time I was waiting for it when he's like we've been dead for years I was like yes cause you're ghosts and then they just like were <laughs> <laughs> I was so stuck on there being more of a supernatural element it's really very far in view yeah yeah, yeah. it's just the ghosts just ghosts mm, just a big I think old if pile they were ghosts. ghosts it would kind of ruin like the, the, the metaphor of the ghosts right that would be so dumb. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, and we, the reason I leave at night is because I turn into a corpse a la dead man's chest. <laughs> <laughs> I turn into a werewolf ghost. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> and we're vampires. Uh, like, <laughs> what else you got? Huh? Frankenstein? <laughs> that Don't anything? look in the basement. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I guess. Yeah, I think it, I think it was better, but I'm mad. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was better, but I wish they... I, I don't know. Yeah. I don't like the answer. I, the whole time they're like, oh, where does he go at night? I'm like, he's fucking his sister. And then I was like, oh, no. He is fucking his sister. You just always catch it. You know? uh, you I mean, no, it wasn't place. subtle. It wasn't I was subtle. hoping that there would be also be some sort of like sinister element to it. 
Like, okay, that was sure, missing for you too. Making sure like the ghosts are locked away or the vats are, you know, some sort of tending to the house maybe. But yeah, just keep, yeah. yeah. But it, was, it was just very, the incest was very straightforward. Yeah, it was just trauma. Again, Eric, it's always just the trauma. It's always just the trauma. <laughs> it can be whatever it is, but at the end of it, it's just, just trauma. trauma. It's just a bad childhood. They, they did seem very nonchalant about like ghosts being in the house. But like, if yeah. I was ghost mom and I was pretty like mad at my children fucking each other, I would just pop up as ghost mom all the time and be like, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. is that why she was? I mean, she was freaking out when they spent the night at the post office because of obviously the evidence of their love and him cheating. Well, maybe on she her didn't want to be needed. alone in the house maybe. too. Exactly. Well, because he wasn't ever with her at night too, so she maybe she was scared to be alone at night. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because she's crazy and all of her like ambition and like life is tied to him mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which is wild that the plot they developed because it's like i'm directly putting him in like that situation to like betray her yeah how did we feel about thomas oh he sucks nice i agree <laughs> i was i mean i was gonna try <laughs> i was gonna try to take an angle of like oh, maybe yeah. we're sympathetic to this dude but probably not yeah usually love a tortured character if they give you the reasons to like them. So, like, I don't know. His soft hands. No, he just, I just didn't, I didn't feel the chemistry. That's my other thing. Mm. So you, you're not mad that you didn't have a moral reason to like him. You're not mad it was. you're mad it wasn't spicy. It wasn't <laughs> spicy. There wasn't the, like, temptation factor really I think there. that's the whole it point. Felt... I thought it was kind of spicy when it was during the dance scene, as it always is. Yeah, but, like. I don't know. The rest of the dialogue was a bit... Mm. Do you think it was on his part or part or both parts? I think... Tom Before Hiddleston... you answer, imagine Benedict Cumberbatch and Emma Stone. Oh, Jesus. Oh. <laughs> Tom Hiddleston could have chemistry with an armchair. Wow. But he did it. So you're sitting, you're blaming it on Mia. But I love So you're her. saying Mia's not a... She's not even an armchair. No, I'm just saying that, like, I don't... I just don't think that they had the chemistry. And obviously she was a late addition to the film, so who knows? She, she could have had... I mean, she had amazing chemistry with Michael Fassbender in... That's true. Jane Eyre. Unfortunately. So, you know... She had great chemistry with the CGI in Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, those... Can we just say it? Those movies... Suck. Oh, desperately so bad. bad. Yeah. Tim Burton bad. Um... <laughs> Tim Bad. Tim Bad. Tim Badton. We like some parts of the gothic genre, not Tim. Um, yeah, so I, I wanted them to have a little bit more chemistry because I think that's what makes gothic fiction so compelling. I kind of felt like there was weird... It wasn't... I think it was just tension between her and Jessica Chastain, too. Oh, yeah. I was like... Yeah, I think everyone actually had more chemistry than... Outside of the main yeah. two. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Because even Charlie and Tom... Haley yeah. had strong sexual tension with the dad at one point. I did not! <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know we could self-insert. I did not! <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god. I liked the dad. <laughs> you did, not me! <laughs> That's Eric. <laughs> <laughs> no, there was just there was a moment in the movie where like it was getting saucy, but it was like right when the dad was walking in too, and Katie Lee went like, "Ooh!" <laughs> and so it just felt like she was just like, "Oh, the dad's here, Jim Beaver, yeah, <laughs> my man, <laughs> oh, hell yeah, Jim what you, Beaver." What, okay, what do you have to tell us? <laughs> I don't really have like any after facts necessarily on That's the okay. production. Uh, it was made for fifty five million dollars, made seventy four point seven million dollars. That's not a good overhead. It's not a great margin there, but it still made its money. That's back. so expensive. That's Is that our most expensive movie? Oh, no, no, no. Really? I love how in the interview that you shared with us, Guillermo's like, oh, yeah, and we had no money. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about the costuming. Yeah. And it's like, no money? Probably for the cost, because they're probably building all those sets. Ugh. And it's crazy, too, because all the ghosts were practical with, like, some like CGI elements, but they like made them look so much more because they made them more transparent in the movie, so they looked less tangible. That's what I was wondering too, because it had an actor for the ghost. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Doug Jones was probably the primary ghost, mm-hmm. and he's like Guillermo's boy who pops up in all his movies. And Literally, 
<laughs> so there's a really really good article called the ghost is just a metaphor Guillermo del Toro's Crimson Peak 19th century female gothic and the slasher uh, by Evangelia Kinder mm-hmm. uh, and they talked about the female gothic which was uh, a term actually coined in like the 1970s that was like reflecting on the gothic era and like mm-hmm. kind of like those people and kind of developing those tropes mm-hmm. so she was breaking it down how a lot of those elements are seen in this movie, and it's pretty much like what Katie Lee just broke down at the beginning. But there also is some criticism against female gothic, uh, one being it called uh, like victim feminism, which is the representation of women as passive victims of patriarchy who are staged as weak and need to be saved before they are reinserted into the domestic life. So a lot of, like, the gothic tropes. And, like, in this, like, when you would, like, think of this, for example, like, there's the hero mm-hmm. character. So Charlie Harmon would te- technically be the guy who comes in and saves her from the reality, then they go off and get married together. Mm-hmm. This movie, though, kind of twists that a little bit because it turns into a slasher movie in the end. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which, yeah. Slasher formulas have their own problems, too. Yeah, it's which, not. <laughs> we move from... <laughs> One, one problem the, to another. Uh, so that this this then the author turns to slashers and then uses Carol J. Clover of Men, Women, Chase Laws about the final girl and how it's been, again about the masculinity and femininity. So even though they kind of twist and turn the virginal girl into the hero, aka what the final girl represents, like typically is, she still is a representation of masculinity using a phallic object to like kind of defeat it. Mm, and what's also, a shovel? Is it phallic? Long and you dig it in the ground. Yeah. Bah! <laughs> and she did bash her head, which usually it's like a knife yeah. or something like yeah. that. It's usually like piercing damage versus butt bludgeoning damage in the D and D terminology. <laughs> she goes this article like this there's so much here. But cool. I just want to get your thoughts real quick on the elements of the female gothic and slasher elements in this movie. hmm I think um, from a female gothic perspective, all of that makes sense. I Depending on when it was written, I wouldn't really discredit the the authors of this fiction because that was their reality. You know, they were oppressed and didn't have any choices. And um, when I was actually doing my research for this talk, there is a um, British rule for the land owners of, you know, like the gentry that have their lands and then their peasants that, you know, give them things keep everything running, um, that they get first dibs on any ladies that they want, even on their wedding night. So it's that kind of, you're stuck, you have no choice, and you have to grapple with it and make it the best you can. And it it is tricky. It's the same thing that you see, you know, like with um, Jane Austen's ending of books. It's like clever and feminist, and there's these things in it, and then it's like, oh, and we're married, because that's the only way they could make their points. That actually reminds me, too, of, like, pulp fiction, like, gay pulp fiction Mm -hmm. back in the day. Like, the ending had to be someone dies, someone is, like, horribly, like, traumatized at the end. That's the only way they could get it published. Yeah. So, like, that was the ending. So, it's like, someone needs to be put in their place for this to be Mm -hmm. palpable. Exactly. Hmm. I don't like it one bit. <laughs> Eric's like, okay. You both turned at me at the same time. It's very powerful. What do you think? Uh, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I get it. It's like, it's never easy. It's all stepping stones. And then, like, they're like definitely taking a huge step with that genre at the time. Yeah. And it's interesting in the 70s when we have another kind of, I think, revolution and some creativity aspects of like reassessing that and like reappropriating it and stuff like that. Yeah, I don't mm-hmm. think you should criticize the genre criticized the creators who put people in that spot, but like not because it's you it's know what I mean. Different. Yeah. yeah. If you look at like um, like in Dracula, written by a guy, um, we have Mina Harker who's like running around trying to be the best, most virginal, settle down, rescue her husband, figure out what's going wrong, and then it's like at the end, it's like mother of evil, but like. You know, that's her whole objective the whole time, and it's written by a man. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's not like, I don't know. I don't think, I don't think it's very helpful to, to criticize, I don't know. You said it better. Just, like, taking the context into play. Yeah. 
And it's interesting, um, in my research as well, I found out that, so Bram Stoker wrote Dracula. He was a manager for a theater, and he actually um, was really fascinated with Oscar Wilde Ooh. and ended up marrying Oscar Wilde's ex and was probably actually just gay. Huh. Yeah. I want to, I want to like, think about Dracula now in that context, though. Yeah, that's Cause, where, because it's like the heavy homoeroticism in that as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. It's just a bunch of dudes. Just <laughs> just a bunch of dudes threatening each other. Yeah. I just keep thinking about how being a human, maybe maybe it's the last two weeks have made me more grateful to be in 2020 somehow. Because yeah. we had the witch, which is like, being a Puritan, bad. Bad. This also, are you rich? You are rich. It's still bad. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, shit. It's yeah. like the, 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 like, trope, the joke of, like, oh, like, the only person who wanted to time travel is, like, a white man. Yeah. Because anybody else would <laughs> be a shitty time. Yeah. Seriously. So. Yeah. It's true. Uh, any other thoughts? We have a few other points here that this article has. I only Go ahead and make your points and we'll jump in. Alright, cool. Uh, ghosts are the fear of the past. As said in the movie, she just straight up saying like, ghosts are representations of the past. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what does the past mean? Because the past can mean all, ju- not just because like your own personal past or the history of a, like an item or a location. It also can mean like the fear of the past or like the fear of losing the past. So in the context of like feminism and her trying to become you know branch out and not be a traditional and just get married you know she wants to be a writer she wants to be successful she yeah. makes a joke about being mary shelley and uh, dying a widow oh it was so rad and charlie hunt was like i'll be i'll die for you i'll bring <laughs> Cause, you because they were like oh they're like oh you're a louisa may alcott but she died a spinster huh also she was gay anyway yeah. <laughs> and then she's like i'd rather be like mary shelley she died a widow and like, bam like turns around and charlie hunnam was simping yeah real hard yeah so yeah so it's just kind of like the fear of like that was everyone just gay everyone was just gay and they couldn't be gay yeah well you think about it like how many people are actually gay versus how many people weren't gay back like weren't allowed to be say they were gay so everybody a lot of people yeah there's a lot of people out there who were gay and no then like literally nobody was able to say it so now it's just us being like well there were gay people back then who was it probably yeah. all these no, people. No, being gay is a new invention. Oh, sorry. Sorry, it was um, sugary cereal <laughs> That's in the 90s. A, there's a drug correlation between gay and Lucky Charms. <laughs> there's all that disco. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's a new thing. <laughs> God. You know what? That reminds me. Will you hand me that? Yeah. <laughs> Wait, this? Yes. Okay. Oh, is that your gay? gay? <laughs> no, it's not being gay. Um, it's a book called The Body Keeps the Score. It's by Bessel van der Kolk, which is the most South African name I've heard in my life. It really is. Um, but the subtitle is Brain, Mind, and Body in the Healing of Trauma. And this talks about how your body keeps a physical, like trauma takes a physical toll in your body and it like lives in your body. Mm-hmm. Like grief and stuff. I haven't read it. <laughs> Did I buy it? Yes. Do I stare at it? Yes. I can't handle it, but okay. that just reminded me of that. Yeah. So if anyone wants to think about that more, go read that book. It's highly acclaimed. I haven't read it. <laughs> read that book. Yeah. <laughs> All your famous authors from the past were gay. And um, so it's like the ghosts can represent that, but also ghosts um, are kind of like used as like a perfect like vessel to describe like the woman's condition. This is all according to the article uh, about um, how ghosts are invisible. Mm-hmm. Uh, usually, it, this is this ties into like the um, victim of feminism, but it, the article talks about being victims of abuse. It's pretty much just it, it was going into how ghosts are kind of like the perfect like monster or vessel to like like talk about the blight of women. How you're invisible, but you still inter- interact with the world. How mm-hmm. it might be like kind of mm-hmm. like uh, usually due to the reason why they're around is due to something that they, the patriarchy has done to them. And so it's kind of reflecting back on that as well. Yeah. Um, and again, this is tying into Carol J. Moss, which we tied and talked about earlier, where women are like portals for the supernatural. Mm-hmm. So of course, a lot of ghosts are represented as women, which mm-hmm. we've seen. I think the thing too, is that even like you said, like things that are done to them by the patriarchy, like women were, 
a lot of women were like inactive participants in their own life. Like they were acted upon. They weren't like doing the acting, but that doesn't mean that they were bad. Like I, I kind of, I kind of like wrinkle it at victim feminism a little bit as a label. I know it's not your label. And I, I know, I know what they're trying to say in that article, but it's like, if you're just being enacted upon, that doesn't mean that it's your fault that you don't have agency in your life, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I I just, (laughs) no, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's true. Um, and it's funny how usually ghosts, like female ghosts were always represented as like, you know, the monsters. Mm-hmm. But in this one, it's, like, the first time where it's, like, oh, no, they're just, like, trying to help you out. They're not, like, the bad ones. Yeah. yeah. So that kind of sucks when, like, a ghost is, like, the villain when they just, like, oh, it's because they went through. Like, that's the grudge. The grudge is just, like, oh, they're a ghost because they had horrible things done to them, so now they kill people. It's, like, that sucks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, why Why are they the villain? It should be the person that did it. And lastly. Well, I, I think, oh, wait, no, I think, oh, of course, we're never going to let you finish it. I think that that speaks to the people who are making the content. That's mm-hmm. exactly what you said. It doesn't make any goddamn sense. It's like, no, like, why are the p- powerless people killing other powerless people? They should be killing the people in power. Mm-hmm. But the people in power are the ones making the narrative. So why would they have them kill themselves? Right. Well, no, that's true, too. Because when there was, like, the feminist movement in America, there was a huge uprise and a lot of, like, you know, like, ghost stuff, too. And, like, a lot of, like, females being, like, the villains and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Was a lot of, like, that EC comic stuff, too. I think so many forms of media are so much better um, when they are written by people who are not obviously not straight white men um because we see like boo sorry eric that's fair but we see like i mean for short stories in the american gothic side um kate chopin's desiree's baby oh fucking desiree's baby yeah jesus christ i haven't heard about desiree's baby since junior year of high school I'm bringing it back i'm thinking of um charlotte what charlotte gilbert perkins um, Yellow wallpaper. Yes. What's her and name? And then um, Joyce Carol Oates. Yes, our girl. Yeah. Joyce Carol Oates. Yeah. yeah. There's, a, there's a whole movement of yeah, female horror writers. What other authors do we know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, we gotta rate it. Oh, man. We must. Ten stars. Wow. I it loved is, it. <laughs> it is out of five. Oh. Um, spooks first. Uh, out of five. Out of five. Five being terrifying. Yes. One being this is laughable. Yes. I would give it a, I, I'm going to say three, I didn't think it was that scary, but it did have a lot of blood and stuff. I did <laughs> gasp a lot. I'm a good audience member. Okay. That's lower than I thought. Yeah. That's I, a lot. I was than, really, I really primed. Like four. No, I was primed by Penny Dreadful. There's so much gore in that show. Good work. Good work, Thanks, you. Penny. Did yeah. it, did it make you feel like the, the horror itch is scratched? By a knife, <laughs> by a wait, cleaver. Wait, wait. Um, <laughs> that's the problem. Is like I feel like now I need more, more specifically. Gothic. Welcome to the shit show. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to your twisted mind. <laughs> that's hereditary time. <laughs> no, no, I mean like more Victorian Gothic horror. That, that more of that. The good news for you is that you've chosen a fruitful genre to plant your horror seeds upon. It's great. I'm so excited. On um, goodness scale, what do you got? Five thousand. Five thousand. Yeah, I would. And scares. I think I would. I think scares wise, I was gonna give it like a three point five. It was a lot gorier than I thought it was going to be. It's like a what is it? Gothic romance. And I was like, okay. And then I was like, that man's head is caved in like a bowl. My mind was like, just I forgot about the gore, and I was like, oh, the ghosts are pretty spooky, right? Ghosts not that spooky. Gore a lot more. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, it was more than I thought, and normally I can't, like, wrap my mind around the gore, like, in Midsummer. I, would, like, was like, that's not a person. But this, I was like, ooh, that's a head squish. So I, did, I didn't like it at all. Yeah. Um, I think I would also, I think I would give it a four. Um, that's fair. Because it was, it was very tidy and delicious. Um, mm-hmm. But I wanted... I wanted a little bit more spookiness. I wanted something... And sizzle. I didn't want the answer to be incest. I wanted the answer to be in- yes and. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yes. it's, yeah. I think I think we could have used a little bit of a little bit of maniacal sparkle in there somewhere. Yeah. And a little bit more chemistry. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. A little bit of spooky. A little bit of sizzle. A little bit of... Little Eric? Bit of me and my oh wow! Okay, the double head turn again. I don't like this spot. <laughs> it's just. I know it's just where I. What sit. it is? And we're just siblings. But you guys start. do it at the same time. <laughs> <laughs>
Is that yeah, worse? Okay. Yeah, it's fine. Okay, well, Eric doesn't normally read it. Eric normally says, Jamie, you're correct. Ah! And then, why have you done this to me? <laughs> <laughs> you That's ruined my favorite say. movie. Oh, Jamie. You, should, you rate it then, this time. <laughs> yeah, yeah you here. rate it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this hasn't gone on too long. Twilight no. has one star. No, <laughs> all of the movies go oh. retroactively. <laughs> That's so, cursed. I hated all the movies. Uh, Crimson Peak scares. I'd probably give it like a two, probably. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Not spooky at all. Like even when the ghosts show up, they're just like not framed spooky. Yeah, they're just kind of gross. They're just kind of there. Mm-hmm. It's just like, ooh, there they are. And you're like, oh, okay. Yeah. And then they're like, here's some helpful information for you. You're like, cool, thank you. A clue. And it's like face dashing. And you're like, okay, well, that's gross. I don't want to see that. Yeah. Um, good. Uh, oof. Um, hmm. <laughs> like a 3 to 3.5. Okay. Okay. So all of our scores combined Makes give sense. it a 4 still. So I am right. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I liked her a lot as a protagonist. I liked her. I thought yeah. she was nice and plucky. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I was rooting for her. She was kind of boring, I guess, but I still liked her. Yeah. That's why I, I felt like she was like... I forgot. This is not a Mia household. No. I, I didn't really... I don't... Like, I thought... I She was better than I remembered her, but she still just doesn't have, like, all of it. Like, if you put a better actress in that role, I think this movie would kind of... Like, if it had a little bit more chemistry with Tom... Yeah. I don't know. Jessica Chastain Ooh, was like... Maybe you're right. Out. Actually, maybe you're talking me out of it. I think you are right. No, 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 no. No, I think... No. Because, I mean, Jessica Jessica Chastain was, like, in her own fucking movie. Oh, she killed... She was, like, Lady Macbeth. Yeah. Yes. But, like, she... Like, when Mia and her were, like, acting off of each other, it felt like she was just acting off of Jessica Chastain. She was just like, I'm in. What? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. you're right, Eric. Fuck. Kimberly, this thanks is great. for coming on the podcast. Oh my god, yeah. thanks for letting me nerd out with you guys. Dude, that was so great. Do you, uh, have, do you have anything to plug? Yeah, what's your, what do you got to plug? Uh, if you want to listen to some spooky dulcimer music, you can follow me on Instagram at desertdulcimer666. Okay, yeah. we're going to link your dulcimer account in Hell the show yeah. notes. All right. Watch those numbers, guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, great. Oh, that was a spooky time. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much for listening, and thank you again to Katie Lee for coming on. Have something you're dying to talk about? Follow us on Instagram at Horoscope Pod with 1D or on Twitter at Horoscope Pod with 2Ds. Your horoscope for the day is Sometimes the Dead Knows Best. Beware of the Hiddlesters.